Hello, future judges, lawyers, court reporters, police officers, whatever your career choice may be, learning how to do mock trial can help you be more successful in life. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about direct and cross-examination of witnesses. We're almost moving backwards. Before you can do your opening statement, a preview of what you're going to prove, and before you can even begin to talk about your case, you have to think about what witnesses there are and what they can show to the jury. So remember how we talked about the wall, you're building it brick by brick? You need to know the facts that each witness knows in order to build your wall. For which side is the witness most favorable? You need to look at both so that you can be anticipating the other side's arguments and do a better job for your side. What is the person's background and character? Remember, we're telling a story. The jury doesn't want some plastic person up there on the stand. They want someone who's humanized, that they know something about, that they can learn from. What does the witness know? Obviously, the police investigator doesn't know the identity of the burglar or robber, but the police investigator knows the evidence that was found at the scene. Obviously, a character witness doesn't really know if his friend or her friend was actually at the robbery. You can't tell a story through somebody who doesn't know what you're telling. Now, most important, just like when a storybook tells you about the scene and the setting, you need to think about what the witness can observe or perceive. What can they see? What can they hear? How far away are they? What do they know? So how do you start even thinking about presenting these facts to a jury? It's kind of hard to break it down, but there's an easy way to do it. Take a piece of paper, draw a line right down the middle. On one side, you're gonna put your side, which I have here in green. On the other side, you're gonna put the other side, the, the side that is unfavorable to you. The things that you're looking for that could hurt your case. And you're gonna make a list of every single thing that you know about each witness that is important to present to the jury. Remember, these are the bricks. These facts are gonna build the whole story little by little for the jury. Okay, some of the facts that you have in your witness statement are gonna be completely irrelevant. They're not gonna have anything to do with the robbery or whether someone's guilty or innocent. So after you make your first list, you can always get rid of things. You can always prioritize and decide what's most important. But you can't prioritize everything if it's not on your list to begin with. Your real key here, because we all have really short attention spans, and I hope you're still listening to me, is to list three or four of the most important facts for each witness when you prioritize your list. And those are the things that you're going to try to show to the jury as you build your wall. So let's take an example. Let's talk about the security guard from our sample bank robbery. Let's say you're the prosecution. You're trying to prove that the accused person is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. We'll talk about proof, burdens of proof later. So what does the security guard know about the whole case? Well, obviously he or she worked at the bank and is familiar with the place. They can describe how scary things were. This person can show the jury what it felt like to be under attack by burglars. Hopefully, your security guard can give a general description of the perpetrators of the crime, the people who came into the bank. And through your security guard, you can prove some of the elements of the crime. So there are legal aspects of the crime that you have to prove in order to convict. For example, you can't prove that there was aggravated robbery without a gun. You can't prove there was robbery without intent to take something not belonging to the accused. Okay, so now you know the general idea of what the security guard has in his or her mind that you need to convey to the jury. But what about the other side? What are they going to say to your witness? We want everything to balance. So before you can figure out your questions for your side, you need to think about what the other side will say. Here are some examples of opposing ideas that the other side might have about your witness. So maybe your witness has a bad job history. So the fact that he or she worked at the bank for a while doesn't really have any weight. Maybe the security guard was so terrified 
that he or she wasn't really thinking clearly. Maybe your security guard only saw the accused from a distance, only saw the burglar from a distance, only saw the robber from a distance. And always, 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 you want to think about biases of witnesses. What, what are the motivations of the witness? What's in their character? So for example, a security guard wants to be tough and protect the bank, right? Maybe your security guard was a little embarrassed that he or she was not able to stop the robbery or was not able to get a really good look at the robbers. Can you create any idea that there's a motive to exaggerate? The hardest thing is after you get your list of facts, pulling those facts out with your questions. This is a little hard for students. You know why? Because you're used to teachers and your parents asking you questions all day long, constantly. You are not used to asking the questions yourselves to get a certain answer. So you kind of want to do things upside down. You list the facts and then you go backwards. And you find the question that's going to get that answer out of the witness. This is, again, more storytelling. So on direct examination, you're, you're questioning a witness who's favorable to your side. Basically, you're presenting your story through the witness. Okay? In the case of the security guard, remember we talked about what the security guard knows. Here's the facts that are in the security guard's mind. How do you take a question to pull out those facts? Well, you want to use what's called direct examination, open-ended questions. Questions that start with things like what, when, where, how, who. You only want to ask open-ended questions when it's a witness favorable to your side. We'll talk more about direct examination in a moment. But cross-examination is different. In cross-examination, the other side is trying to cast doubt on your witness. The other side is trying to poke holes in your wall. So for example, on cross-examination, the person might be asked, the security guard might be asked about those items that we had on the red side of our list. When you're doing cross-examination, when you're attacking a witness on the other side, you only want to ask questions that suggest an answer. Those are called leading questions. We're going to go into both of these kinds of questions in more detail. Okay, do you see the guy on the right trying to pull a tooth? You're trying to pull out the answers using your questions. So again, we're using the security guard and let's pretend you're the lawyer for the, con for the prosecution. You're trying to convict the burglars who come into the robbers who have come into the bank to steal. Remember, we talked about how you want to introduce the witness to the jury. Well, for a background question, you would ask open ended questions to pull out the facts. For example, what is your job? How long have you been working there? After you introduce the witness with a few open ended questions, you want to start getting into the events of the crime. Of course, that's what the jury really wants to hear about. So you're going to ask more open-ended questions when it's your witness favorable to your side. You'll say, what happened on the afternoon while you were working at the bank? What time of day was it? What did you see? How did you know that they were coming in to rob the bank? Things like that. You can always ask follow-up questions if the witness doesn't give you exactly the answer that you want. Again, remember how I talked about the scene and the setting? When you're thinking about your facts and creating questions to pull out those facts, you wanna think about the observations of the witness, what they could see. You're gonna ask things like, what did you see next? How tall was the robber with the gun? How did, long did you get to observe the robbers? You wanna give the witness credibility by giving the security guard a chance to tell a story to the jury. Now remember, when it's your witness who's favorable, you want that jury to be watching the witness, learning to trust the witness. You don't want the jury looking at you. That's why your questions are open-ended. So that really the person who's doing all the talking is the witness. The witness and the witness stand should be the focus of the courtroom. When you ask things like, what did you see? What happened next? How tall was the robber? On the other hand, cross-examination is totally different. When the defense comes to cross-examine your witness, they're gonna to try to poke holes in the wall that you built with your open-ended questions. 
the lawyer is going to want to ask questions that lead the witness. See the dog on the leash here? That's what a good cross-examiner does. You use questions like, and again, this is the defense now questioning the security guard. Isn't it true that? Am I correct that? Wouldn't you agree with me that? So for example, a good cross-examiner, the defense, after you've put on your direct of the security guard, might ask questions like, and you were at least 20 feet away, right? You never saw the face of the robbers because they were wearing masks. Isn't that true? There are lots and lots of ways to lead the witness and suggest the answer. Sometimes students ask 100 isn't it true questions, and those work really, really well. But there's a lot of ways to vary your questions so that you can ask things like, you can put the fact at the beginning and say, isn't that right? Or you can start, start the sentence with, am I correct that? It doesn't really matter how you structure your sentence. As long as you're getting a point across and you're controlling the witness, suggesting their answer. So if the security guard says no to any of these questions, you've still planted the idea in the mind of the jury that maybe the security guard wasn't that close and maybe couldn't really observe everything about the robbers. When the defense is cross-examining the security guard or any witness, you wanna focus on leading questions. Put one fact in each question. It's gonna be very tight and very concise. You wanna get yes or no answers as much as possible, although not every leading question will lead to a yes or no answer. Keep it really simple. And again, here are examples. Bad would be to say, what color was the car? That's really a direct question you wanna ask of your favorable witness. But a good cross-examination question would be, the car was yellow, right? So again, let's do a quick example with the security guard. Remember that when you ask the security guard questions on direct, he or she talked about background, state of mind, and the ability to observe. So a good cross-examiner, your opponent, is going to come in and ask questions like, isn't it true that you only worked at the bank a few months? And in fact, you have been fired from several other security jobs, haven't you? What does this do? This places doubt in the mind of the jury. It pokes holes in the wall that you built. How about the state of mind of the security guard? You were terrified when this was happening, right? What does that do to the jury? The jury is starting to make inferences. The jury is starting to think about what's happening on the stand and starting to draw conclusions based on the facts that are being presented. So visibility and observation, especially in criminal cases, are very, very important. State of mind is important in criminal cases and civil cases. So for example, cross-examination, the defense to try to prove uh, the accused innocent might say, and your security station is at the front of the bank, not by the tellers, isn't that right? So that means you are at least 25 away feet away from the robbers. And they were masked too, correct? You're just like you on direct, you're building a wall brick by brick. On cross-examination, using leading questions that suggest an answer, you're trying to take away those bricks so that the whole wall tumbles. Unlike direct, on cross-examination, the lawyer is the star. The person asking the direct questions really wants the witness to be at the front of the focus of the jury. But in the case of cross-examination, you really want to be in control and you want to really convey that you are the person that the jury should be paying attention to as the lawyer. Here's a hole in the wall, but you always want to end cross on a high note. It is very, very hard. Cross-examination is not easy because sometimes the witness will start to explain things and will go in a totally different direction. You have to be prepared to change the order of your questions. I always like to have a cross-examination question saved that I know the answer to that could be a high note for me to end on. You always want to end any witness examination with a strong point for your side so that that's what sticks in the mind of the jury. And if you get a great response from someone on cross-examination, just stop. Don't keep asking questions because you want to make sure that you end on that high note. Thank you for your time today.
listening to direct and cross-examination questions, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.